Did you know that this morning, God has a really specific personal message for you? Sometimes it's hard to believe that the God of the universe, the one who spoke into existence our planet and our universe, would be that intimate and that precise, but He is. Can you believe that He really has a very specific word for you? You know, if you're new to Cottonwood, our services basically have three parts to them. We come together and the first thing we do is worship because we want to begin always by giving Him glory and Him honor. But when we do that, He actually helps us because it focuses us. It, it creates what the Bible says is a fertile soil. And then we open up the Word, we study the Bible, but it's not about just learning a life principle. It's a divine revelation of a powerful God who intimately wants to say something to you. And then we close by having a time of response where we respond to what he said. We've done our worship, now we're going to open up the word. And after we do that, we're going to let him minister to us and meet us wherever we're at. But you have to believe. You have to believe. God has something to say to me so that you will open up your heart and you will open up your mind. Let me pray. Jesus, we do believe. We know that you have something to say to us. We are here. We're listening. And we are incredibly grateful that the God of the universe chooses and desires to be personally and intimately connected with each of us. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever, uh, like me, had moments where you are a Christ follower, you follow God, and yet you feel like you don't have the power that you know you should have as a child of God? You don't have the power to change your life the way you want to. It seems like the circumstances around you don't change. You don't have the power to help others. There are times when we go through life and we feel weak, powerless. This happened to the disciples as well, where there was one instance where they were supposed to uh, heal this little boy and they couldn't do it and Jesus had to come along. And he healed the boy. And later on, they grabbed Jesus and they said, why didn't we have the power? Why couldn't we make the difference? And oftentimes that's a question we ask Jesus. Why didn't I have the power to live the way I know you wanted me to live? Why did my prayers seem to go unanswered for that healing or that financial need? Why, why didn't I have the power to make the difference in my workplace the way I really wanted to? This is the question that the disciples asked Jesus. And Jesus gives them this response and he teaches them in a really outrageous statement about faith. And tonight, today, the message that Jesus wants to give you is a teaching about faith. Not faith as the world defines it, as in can you trust somebody, can you rely on somebody. But a divine power for supernatural living. Here's the statement that Jesus makes to them. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, let's be honest. That's kind of an outrageous statement, isn't it? I mean, I can understand some of you going, are you sure? If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. Jesus wants to get in our face with this. He does not want to be subtle about it. And we thought in order for you to really understand the power of this statement to them and to us, you would really need to kind of have one in your hand. So the ushers are going to come, and they're going to give every one of you a mustard seed for you to hold, all right? There's going to be a little dish that's, go ahead and start, guys. It's going to come alongside and give you a mustard seed. Now, here's the deal. They're really small, so don't drop it. Because <laughs> if you drop it, you will not find it. But he doesn't say you need lots of mustard seed, just one. So don't take two and put one in your back pocket for later. Don't steal in church. Not a good thing. But I want you to 
see even how awkward it is just to get a hold of one of these things. In another passage in the Gospels, Jesus would say, this is the smallest thing that we plant with, this mustard seed. And as it comes along, go ahead and grab it out of that uh, container. And in this statement, what we're going to discover is Jesus gives two very important principles on faith. When you know these principles, it really positions you to see what it means to live in faith and see his power. And then what he does is he says, here's the two principles on faith. Here are three areas of life where you need to apply your faith. And the three areas of life are a current crisis, a future dream, and Jesus fully in me. Many of us in here are in a current crisis. Right now, there is an issue going on in our lives, and it seems like a big mountain, insurmountable. We have dreams for what we want to see the future look like, hopes and aspirations. Faith is applied there. And then lastly, probably most importantly, faith to believe that Jesus wants to be fully formed in you, that the character of God his integrity, his truth, his hope, his joy, his peace, his love, that all of that can be formed inside of you. So Jesus says, in this one statement, you're going to discover these two principles and these three areas of application that are available for you. So first, let's look at the two principles. Here's the first one. It's this. The power of faith is in the object of faith. Here's what he does. He picks up a seed for them. And he says, I want you to think about this. This is all the faith you need. They're asking, why didn't we see your power? This is all the faith we need. Here's this seed. But he draws the contrast between this massive mountain and this smallest seed. He's saying, the smallest thing you can think of and see compared to the biggest mountain that's there. Here's what takes place in us that can really demoralize us. We look at our huge mountain, the crisis we're facing, and we look at the little bit of faith we have, and we begin full of despair. It seems impossible that this problem could be solved. It seems impossible that this mountain could be moved, because this is all I have. And Jesus is really intentional in bringing about this contrast, because he wants us to rethink what we're comparing. He's saying, listen, it's not about comparing the size of your faith to the size of the mountain. It's about comparing the size of your God to the size of your mountain. Because when you know the size of your God, all you need is this much faith. This seed by itself does nothing. It's got to be put in soil. It needs a place to be planted in order for it to actually work. Faith on its own does nothing. The value and the power of faith is in the object in which it is placed. That's where it finds its sole power. Listen, everybody lives by faith. Don't ever let anybody tell you, no, 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 I don't live by faith. You come to an intersection, when your light turns green, you are trusting the people who have the red light that they will not drive through it. You are living by faith. When you walked in here this morning, you sat in that chair. You're living by faith. You are trusting that that chair will hold you. Now, maybe you have good reasons, to trust that chair because you've sat in the same chair for the last 20 years and it's always worked for you? Or because you trust Cottonwood as an organization? But you're living by faith. Now picture this, two guys are standing on the edge of a frozen lake and in the middle of the lake is a great reward but the lake is frozen, they've got to step out onto it. I know for some of you Southern Californians, frozen lake is hard to imagine, bear with me, but there's this frozen lake, right? One of the guys is nervous. He's kind of full of fear. He doubts whether or not that ice is going to hold them. We're going to fall through. There's a lot of anxiety in him. The other guy is enthusiastic. He can't wait to get out on the ice. He knows for sure that that ice is going to hold them. He wants to get to the prize. What determines whether or not they fall through or don't fall through? The quality of the ice. Not the guy who's nervous versus the guy who's excited. It is the ice, and if it's thick enough or thin enough. Now, they may or may not get on the ice based upon where they're at in their trust. How they journey to the prize may be different. One may be full of joy, the other may be full of anxiety. But it is the ice 
that determines whether or not they're going to be safe. This is what Jesus is teaching. He's saying, listen, you've got this big mountain. You only need a mustard seed of faith. Why? Because of the character and the immensity and the quality of who God is. And it's not just his power. Think of his power. The creator of the universe with his words compared to your problem. But it's not just his power. More essentially, it's his character. Because you can have a powerful force, but if that power is not trustworthy, it's no good. It is in the character of God that we discover, wow, I only need a mustard seed because of who he is. That's why Psalms 27, 13 says this. You'll see it on the screens. I would despair. This is David talking. When I look at my mountain, I would despair, except I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Whatever your mountain is, there is a character of who God is that is so much greater than that mountain. If you are here and you're facing some kind of an illness, there is a healer who created health. If you are here and you're facing a financial crisis, there is a provider who owns everything, as we discovered. If you are here and you're in a situation where you really feel alone, there is a God who chooses to be a father so that you'll never be alone. It is who God is in response to our mountain where Jesus says, listen, he's so big, so amazing, so indescribably in love with you and perfect that all you need is to believe the size of a mustard seed. And we have to be really careful because when we don't see the mountain move, here's what takes place. We begin to go, wow, my fault. My fault. I don't have enough faith. Something's wrong with me. Jesus wants to counteract that, say, no, all you need is this mustard seed because he's so big, he's so grand. Now, some of you are going, well, doesn't faith grow? Absolutely it does. But it doesn't grow by just saying, how do I get my faith to grow? It grows by discovering more of Jesus. Because when you discover Jesus, you discover the character of God. 32 years ago, when I married my wife, I trusted her. But over 32 years, I experienced her faithfulness and her love and her integrity. I trust her so much more now. My faith in her has grown so much more because I've gotten to know her. And Jesus says, listen, here's how this works. Faith and the power of God is released when you discover that the power of your faith is rooted in who God is. That's what makes it happen. What God trait do you need to know? Rediscover. Seal in your heart. Because when you know that God trait, it's all it needs. It's so much greater than any mountain, any crisis, any issue that I may be facing. First principle, the power of faith is found in the object of faith. Here's the second principle, and that is that the power of faith is in the act of faith. Every seed, take out your seed, you still got it, you haven't dropped it yet, you still have it in your hands. It's hard. Every seed has to be planted. We know that a seed needs soil, but somebody's got to take the seed and actually take a trowel and put it in the soil in order for it to be planted. There's got to be an action. And Jesus is really clear when he talks to these disciples. And he says, listen, you've got to speak to the mountain. There is a role that you play to see faith work and God's power released. Now, fortunately, he doesn't look at the disciples and says, you've got to move the mountain. He says, no, all you have to do is speak to the mountain. And he brings out this other principle. Here's the mustard seed. Look at it again. It applies to your action. Here's what he's saying. Do you have enough faith just to start? Here's what takes place. We see our mountain, and it seems insurmountable. I can't get to the top of that mountain. I can't see that thing moved. And we're paralyzed. But when he brings out the metaphor of a mustard seed, He's saying, you don't have to see yourself conquering the mountain. You just have to have enough faith to start. That's the mustard seed action. Lady came to me. She was in her 40s. She said, Joel, I really feel like God has 
called me to go to law school. But I can't imagine going to law school. I can't imagine sitting in those courses. I can't imagine trying to tackle all that. I'm in my 40s. She was looking at her mountain, and it seemed insurmountable. She didn't understand the mustard seed concept yet. I said, you don't have to see yourself graduating. You don't have to see that at all. You just have to have enough faith to fill out an application. Could you do that? Could you believe enough that you could just fill out an application? And she said, yeah, I could believe enough that I'll fill out an application. So she filled out an application. Two months later, she comes back to me. I got accepted. They actually are allowing me to come to school. But Joel, I feel horrible because I know God's asked me to do this, but it's too much. I can't wrap my brain around this whole three-year endeavor. It's just way too much. I said, you don't have to go. Don't worry about that. Do you have enough faith just to register for classes? <laughs> just to register and buy some books. You're not making a commitment. <laughs> yeah, I have enough faith. I could register for classes. I'll even buy the books. I have enough faith to do that. So she registered for classes. You know where this story's going, right? <laughs> Five years later, she's an amazing lawyer, fighting for injustice, graduated. She didn't start there. And this mustard seed principle becomes very important to us when it comes to the act of faith because oftentimes we feel like our action can only take place when we see the top of the mountain. No. Do you have enough simply to start? Because here's how it works in partnership with God. When Jesus tells the disciples, you speak to the mountains, he's saying, listen, you join together in partnership. We do something good, and then Jesus does something God. We do a good act. You were created to do good works. He does a God act. And they put themselves together. This lady did a good act. She turned in an application. God did a God act. You see this throughout scriptures where there's a boy. He's got a few fish, a few loaves. 5,000 people need to be fed. He does a good act. He brings the fishes and loaves to Jesus. Jesus does a God act. 5,000 people are fed. There are four friends. They have another friend who's paralyzed on a mattress. I am fairly confident they could not envision their friend getting up and walking out. But they do a good act. They lower him down to the roof in the front of Jesus. Jesus does a God act. And we come together in partnership with him. What good act? What first step? What mustard seed action do you need to take because the power of faith is released in action without Works, faith is meaningless, the Bible says. And we've got to be really careful that we don't find ourselves doing the action for the wrong reason. Sometimes what we'll do is, okay, i got to act because I have to prove to God I have enough. What could I do that will prove to God that I have enough faith? And we're going against what Jesus is teaching here. First of all, I don't know if you know this, but God knows everything about you. You don't really need to prove anything. He knows your heart. He knows your mind. He knows the status of your faith. He doesn't want you to prove your faith. He wants you to participate with him. He wants you to be a co-creator all the way back in Genesis with Adam. Adam, you name the animals. Let's join together. God's desire is to be with you and to see your mountain moved, to see your dream fulfilled, to see Christ formed in you together. So he says, listen, speak to the mountain. Do something. And in that action of faith, God's power begins to be released. That's why Hebrews 11.6 is so important where it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Why? Because God wants to be with us in doing life together. Think of your mountain right now. It could be a current crisis. It could be a future dream. It could be Christ being formed in you. Think of your mountain. What is that step of faith you can take? Just mustard seed. You don't have to climb the mountain. You don't have to conquer the mountain. What's that application you need to fill out? What's that phone call you need to make? What's that CLC course you need to take? When we act in faith, we are joining God, pleasing him, and his power is released. So here's these two principles. The Power of faith is in the object. God is so great in his character that I'm going to compare God to my mountain, not my mustard seed to the mountain. 
The power of faith is in the action of faith, but I don't have to do everything. I don't have to envision being able to conquer the mountain. I just need to take that first step. I have to have enough faith just to start. And then Jesus applies it in these three areas. For every one of us, there's a current crisis, and there's a future dream, and there is wanting Christ to be formed in us. Think first about this current crisis. The disciples had a problem. But here's what's important to understand. They had a problem together. Together they tried to heal this boy. Together they couldn't do it. Jesus gathers them together. When he speaks to them, using the word you, it's always plural. And what this passage is trying to teach us is that when we have a crisis, faith and this mustard seed means that it cannot happen alone. A seed is never planted by itself. It's always planted in clusters. My kids wanted an apple tree, and the apple tree expert told me, you can't just plant one apple tree. You've got to plant a couple of them, because together they grow and are healthy. And when you have a current crisis, faith needs people. The Bible teaches this. When you rejoice, we rejoice. When you suffer, we suffer. And none of us were called by God to navigate our crisis alone. For many of us, our mountain falls in one of three categories. It either falls in a health category, there's a physical illness, sometimes an emotional illness, or it falls in a money category, we need finances, things are tight, or it falls in a people category. When it comes to the physical health, we don't seem to have a problem reaching out for others. But these other two areas, money and people especially, we kind of hide out. And if that's your mountain, and you're trying to navigate that by faith alone, you're kind of going against what God's design is. That's why Jesus said this in Matthew 18, 20. He says, listen, where uh, two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Why is it so important to God that our faith be together? Why does he almost require as a mandate, you want to see my power? You got to do this together. Because it's who he is, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. They trust each other. Trust is inherent in the character of God. So the Father trusted that the Son would go to the cross. The Son trusted in the leadership of the Holy Spirit while he walked this earth. Inherent in God is trust. So he says, I need to see that down here. Faith, by its very nature, reflects God, is community. And when you try to navigate faith for a crisis alone, you're stepping out of God's design. Best example of this is Jesus. The religious leaders come to Jesus, and they say, why do you do what you do? And here's how he answered them. I only say what the Father tells me to say. Amen. I only do what the Father tells me to do. He says, even as the Son of God, I'm going to trust somebody in the Godhead to work with me and guide me. It's who he is. When you are in a crisis... If you're relying on your individual ability to navigate that crisis, you're putting yourself in a really dangerous position. Because when you're in a crisis, there's all stuff, all kinds of stuff going on. Emotionally, your soul is all over the place. It's hard to see clearly at times. And you've got to make faith choices. But if you try to do that alone in the middle of this whirlwind of intensity, it's very easy to be sled. I learned to swim when I was a little older. I was six years old. And uh, imagine I'm standing on the edge of the pool. And my dad's there and he's wanting to teach me to swim. So he's in the pool and he's got his arms up and he's saying, Joel, jump into my arms, jump into my arms. And I'm a little nervous. I'm a little fearful. And I got to decide, do I jump into his arms? Next to my dad is my brother who's two years older and a head taller. And he is Satan incarnate. And he's, in, <laughs> he's sitting, standing right next to my dad and he's got his arms up in the air. And with that evil smirk on his face, he's going, jump into my arms, Joel. Jump into my arms. I'll catch you. Now, I got to decide. The Bible says that the enemy comes as an angel of light. <laughs> and he goes, jump into my arms, Joel. Jump into my arms. And when I'm in a crisis, and I can't think clearly, and I'm in an emotional whirlwind, if I try to figure it out alone, I may make the wrong act of faith. Next to me was my sister, who is five years older than me, and she is an angel. And she looked over and she goes, you're not going to jump into his arms, are you? 
Joel, jump into dad's arms. And she could tell I was a little nervous. And she said, you know what? Joel, I'll jump with you. And she grabbed my hand. And together we jumped into the pool. This is a picture of how faith moves mountain when we're in a crisis. We are not called to navigate that alone. And if you're here and you've got this mountain and it seems overwhelming to you, and you go, wow, I'm inspired because I know the size of God against my mountain. I've got to take this act of faith, but I can't take it alone. Then there's this area of a future dream. Jesus says, listen, one little word, if you have, if you hold it in your possession, when you look at a seed, hold your seed up again, happy you lost it, that's okay. <laughs> if you look inside this really microscopic seed, inside of it holds the DNA of its future reality. This little seed planted grows, becomes a huge mustard tree. A seed carries the DNA of its reality. We have this future dream, and it seems insurmountable. But when we have a seed of faith, we have in our possession everything we need. The whole DNA of that dream is right there. It's just in seed form. We can't see it yet. But it's all fully present. And one of the challenges about faith is faith is about the unseen. But God doesn't leave us alone. He gives us the seed, saying it's all in here. Look at this verse out of 2 Corinthians. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. What is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You go, well, wait a minute, Joel. If I can't see it in the natural, how do I know what God's dream for my future is? If I can't see it, and it's in a seed form, it's all there, but I can't see it in the natural, how do I know? We open the Bible up, and in the Bible, God gives us all of his promises, which are his dream for our life that he has given us the seed for. And when we know his promises from his word, not just principles for living, but divine revelation, this is God's future for my life, then I know I've got the seed of that dream. Here's how it works. Many of us in here have been hurt by a family member. And there is a pain that's in us. We open up the Bible and we get the promise from God that through his grace we can walk in a freedom and we don't have to carry that pain. We don't have to carry any of that insult that happened to our character. We can walk in a freedom. And because I know that that's his dream for my future, even though I just have the seed, right now I can forgive that person because of that dream that God has. And I can begin to walk in that freedom and that dream becomes a reality. Some of us in here have some real financial challenges. Our mountain is defined by money. And I open up the Bible and I discover the promises of how God is a faithful provider. Now, I just have it in a seed. I don't see it in the natural. But because of that seed that's there, I can begin to give. And in giving, I am joining God, recognizing his reality will begin to take place. For some of us who aren't here, we're sick in our body. There's some illness that's there. We don't see health in the natural, but I open up the Bible and I read the promises about God as a healer and his character and how he created health and how he wired the body even to heal itself. And I say, wow, that's God's future dream for me. I only have a seed of it. Can't see it in the natural, but because I have a seed of it from his word, okay, now I can give him thanks even though I don't see it yet. Because I'm acting on the seed that's there. Do you see how powerful that little thing is you're holding? How amazingly powerful? Because in it is everything of God's dream for your future that comes through his word. Some of you are just in despair. You don't even know why. You wake up in the morning and there's just a cloud that hangs over you. And it really agonizes you and you don't know why. And you open up the word and you discover about God and his love for you and his grace and joy. And that becomes that seed that's there. Now you don't see it in the natural yet. It's a seed. It's a dream for the future. But because his word says, listen, I'm a God of joy and I will lead you into joy, I can now begin to worship him even though I don't see it yet. This is the power behind this seed where he says, listen, all you need 
is the size of this seed. And your current crisis, together, will move mountains. Your future dream, everything of God's dream for you is in that little seed he's planted in you. You just got to begin to work it out like the lady who went to law school. And then the last area is Christ in me. Where for faith, it's not just about this issue or this possibility. But faith is for something divinely supernatural, Christ being formed in me. Because for some of us, when we look at our lives, we have a hard time believing that Jesus could actually transform us into exact, his exact likeness. Amen. Amen. I could have that kind of peace. I could have that kind of compassion. I could have that kind of forgiveness. And this last word that he gives at the bottom, nothing will be impossible for you. When Jesus said that in the New Testament, it's always related to him talking about somebody being saved and made whole and complete. Because when you take the seed and you plant it and it grows into fruition, it's complete. You don't see a mustard tree grow but not have any leaves. How do we attach leaves to the mustard tree? In that seed is the completeness of everything. So in you is the potential completeness of Christ being fully formed in you, faith. Nothing will be impossible. It's for everything. It's limitless. But understand its limit, not just by size. Let me explain it to you this way. When I went to grad school, some of the courses I took were tough. But some of them were easy. So I go to one course, and it's a really easy course. I knew I could ace this course. Knew the content. Knew the teacher was a pretty easy teacher. No problem, I can ace it. Because it was easy, I did not invite God in faith to be a part of that course. Because for me back then, faith was defined by mountains that I could not climb. And when faith is only defined by what you cannot do, you will only invite God into certain aspects of your life, not into every aspect of your life. Because if you can do it, don't need God. So I'm in this grad course. I finished it. I got the A, but when I begin to learn about faith and the limitlessness of faith and how God wants to be involved in every aspect of my life, forming Christ in me, I begin to wonder, looking back at that course, what did I miss out on? What truth could I have gleaned and discovered more than just what was needed to pass the course? What opportunity with fellow students did I miss out on? Because I didn't go into that course going, God, I am trusting you with this course. God wants us to trust him, not just in the things we can't do. He wants us to trust us in the things that are very easy for us to do. He wants faith to be limitless. What areas of your life right now do you have under such good control that you're not trusting God with them? And then it limits what he can do. Because remember Ephesians 3.20? He is greater to do anything I could ever ask or imagine, which means that if I define God's involvement only by problems I can't handle, I am missing out on so much more that God has for me. So here is this faith that is limitless in what it can provide for me. Two principles. Your faith, you only need it the size of a mustard seed because he is so great. Not just in power, but in character. You get to know Jesus you'll discover the character of God. Your faith, mustard seed, involves an action. But it's just one step. Faith enough to start. In a current crisis, where there's a real issue, together, we'll believe. In a future dream, I have that seed. I gotta take that step. And in Christ being formed in me, I can't have any aspect of my life no matter how easy it is or how comfortable it is, where I'm not saying, God, how do I trust you with this area? How do I trust you with your presence here and now? And then faith becomes limitless. Some of you in here fit those three buckets. You're facing a real crisis and you have this huge mountain. Some of you in here have a dream that's not fulfilled yet, and it's hard to imagine that it could be fulfilled. Some of you in here really know you have this passion to see Christ formed in you in a great way. This is his teaching. If you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. 
Here's where we get to that third part where we now respond with an expectation. Jesus, meet us at our point of need. When you came in, you should have received a communion element. If you did not receive a communion element, please raise your hand, and the ushers will make sure that you get one. I'm going to invite the worship team to come out here and join me. Hold your hand up, and they'll give one to you. While they're doing that, I want you to take a look at the screens as to a really important statement that Jesus made. It comes out of John chapter 6. That he gets asked this question by his followers. What are the works of God we should do? What, what should we be doing? What should we be active about? And here's how he answered. The work, of, the work God wants from you is to believe in the one he has sent. This is really all that God wants from you. Faith. Will you believe in the one he has sent? And Jesus set it up to help us be able to do that through communion. Started all the way back when he walked this earth. He took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body. He took the cup, poured it out and said, this is my blood. He said, listen, if there's ever a time when you're going to doubt my love for you, if there's ever a time when you're going to doubt where you stand before me, remember this. If you're here this morning and you question where you stand with God, whether or not he loves you, whether he smiles on you, you remember his cr cross, there will be no doubt whatsoever. But we don't take it as a religious ritual. We take it as an act of faith, something very intimate, something very personal and dear. Sometimes I get asked by people, Joel, I, I don't know I don't even know if I'm a Christian. What does that mean? What does that look like? And I said, really, if you can say these three things, if you can make these three statements, you're good. The first statement is, I'm sorry. You recognize there is a God who is the creator of the universe, this God of love, this God of peace, but you have chosen to be your own God, and you say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God. Second statement is, I'm ready. I don't want to run my life anymore. I am ready for your lordship, your beauty, your grace, your love. I'm ready for an eternity with you. I'm ready. But the third statement you make is this, I believe. Not I understand. None of us understand all of this. But somewhere in my heart, I can, yeah, I can believe that God is real. And he is love and he sent his son to die for me and resurrect because he loves me so much and wants to be with me. I can believe. I don't even know how, but I do. I believe in my heart. If you can say, I'm sorry, I'm ready, I believe. That's all God is really asking. And then we take communion with that seed of faith. As we take communion this morning, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet with me. And I'm going to say a prayer over all of us before we take communion. Because there may be some of you here this morning, and it's your first time in the church, and you want to say those three statements, I'm sorry, I'm ready, I believe. Maybe some of you have been away for a long time, and you need to just kind of re-clarify with God. Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, we are at a loss of words to give you thanks that you would come to this earth and take our evilness on you and suffer and die so that we could be free, that you would resurrect, that we could have life eternal with you, with God. I thank you for each person you have brought into this auditorium. And Lord, collectively, we make those three statements. We are sorry that we have not acknowledged you as our God, our creator. And we are ready. We are ready for a life full of peace and joy and love and your power. And Lord, we do believe, I thank you for this teaching you gave, that your expectation is simply a mustard seed size, that that's enough faith, trusting you, the mountains in our life must move. So Lord, we take communion as you instructed. 
reflecting on the work that you did. May there be no despair or doubt because of the cross of Christ. May anybody in here who questions their eternity or your love during this moment of communion, Holy Spirit, would you instill in them an assurance because of the cross of Christ. May we be so fully aware of mountains moving because of the cross of Christ. Go ahead and peel that top layer off and it reveals the wafer representing the body of Christ and take that. And then peel the second layer off and it opens it up for the juice representing the blood of Christ. Go ahead and drink that. And as you take communion, would you just lift your hands and just begin to thank him? Just begin to thank him for his incredible goodness. Thank him for his love, for his grace. Just to have this moment with him where you are so grateful for who he is. Thank you.